Hello everybody, I'm your host Hal Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organisations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode. Uh, I'm joined today by Gonzalo Crespo, Aerospace Manager at ESOL Group. ESOL Group is a global engineering and technical assistance services company, and the business has experience in more than 40 countries, I believe, around the world in sectors such as energy, or the automotive sector, civil works, telecommunications, and obviously defense and space. The aerospace division of the business was actually set up in 2019 with um, a team of engineers from across the company with experience in things like satellite communications and space and um, is nowadays composed of a range of engineers working on software and uh, electric and mechanical aspects, but focusing primarily on antennas and feeds in a a variety of missions and, and service areas. And that's what we're going to talk about with Gonzalo today. So Gonzalo, hi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for being here. Hi, everybody. Thank you. It's a pleasure to share this time with you and being able to talk about uh, antennas and remote stations. So it's great for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Now, today we're going to talk mainly about um, ground station antennas and, and feeds. Now, before we, uh, before we get into the specific questions, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of an overview of the different kinds of ground station antenna that people can you know, access on the market today? Yeah, sure. Basically, there are two types of uh, ground station antennas. Uh, the antennas for reception of radio waves from astronomical radio source, typically big dishes with huge gain in order to be able to listen further uh, into the space and operate into different frequencies, but depending on what scientific uh, experiments uh, are looking for. No? And then uh, the most commercial antennas that are antennas for communication with spacecraft can be satellites, launchers, space station probes, depending on a, on application, can be for remote sensing, telemetry, data link, or broadcasting services. So there is different, or there are different type of uh, ground station antennas, and there are of course uh, different frequencies now of operation depending on the type of communications and application, but. All this communication must be regulated by the I2, the International Telecommunications Union. And moreover, typically each satellite operator also has their own technical standards for ground standard station and satcom terminal. So they also uh, must be uh, standard compliant. When traditionally communicating with satellites, you are using UHF, VHF frequencies, typically uh, Yagi antennas uh, or similar are used. But when you are moving into higher frequencies, such as SXK bands, traditionally reflector antennas are used. Size of reflector can vary depending on the frequency of operation and also the gain requirements. And this is a key factor for the ground station def- def- definition. And depending on that, uh, there, there can be a ground stations varying from 3 meters up to 13 meters or even more if, uh, for example, for deep space communication. No? Uh, recently, with the increase of uh, new space and the, mainly the increase of missions in LEO and NEO constellations, the installation of new ground stations is of great importance, but frequencies and sizes are changing and moving to smaller antennas. So we have more antennas, but smaller ones, uh, typically. And today, I think we are going to focus on ground stations now. Used for communications and operation of LEO, MEO, and GEO satellites, which are the most common ones. And especially focus about the RF part of ground stations, which is what uh, EOSOL is specializing. You know? And uh, I think, uh, yeah, we can give an overview of, of all of, of this. Thank you for the overview, firstly, um, on the different aspects of the market. And ho- hopefully, it's a great introduction to people. But yeah, if you could give us in brief, you know, what the architecture of the uh, of a ground station is and then how the, um, where the uh, satellite antenna or the ground station antenna fits in so that people understand what the different parts of these systems are that we are hopefully going to discuss further. 
Well, satellite radio stations play a critical role in satellite network as it needs to take care of recording all the information uh, coming from the space no? and receive very weak and noisy signals, recover them and post-processing for to give the extract the signals and do it for the system. No? Uh, to do so, typically, architecture of ground station is the next. There is the, the antenna, a reflector, the, who receives or transmits the signal. Then the feed chain, composed by the passive part, typically horn, web ties, tracking monopoles, OMTs, deplexers, where the signal travels. And then the active part, uh, LNAs, uh, power amplifiers, to adequate the, and regenerate the, the signal. And finally, the up converter, down converter block to convert the RF signal into IF signal. No? These are more, more or less the, the main part of the RF chain. Then there is the, the modem to manage uh, receive it or transmit the info and connect directly to the computer or hardware to connect the signal and also be transmitted by fiber optic or a point-to-point -point microwave link in case the computer or hardware is in remote uh, from the antenna no? and, and finally uh, typically if uh, we have a ground station that uh, must uh, point to a target uh, we have the antenna control unit that is a mechanical hardware in charge to uh, move the antenna in order to point to a specified target. And now with new developments, uh, first electronic pointed antennas are starting to become real, but robust solutions are still some time away. And in any case, for some application, it will still be better to use the traditional system composed by reflector uh, pointing system. No? This is what a traditional ground station is composed by. In short, a ground station is a communication system that allows sending and receiving information and adequate the signal to allow communication with satellites and spacecraft. That's it. Just one thing uh, from all this part, uh, what EOS Solar Space is specialized is in the development of the reflector and the air feeds, which is the first part of the signal that sees the, when it arrives at the ground station or the last one when it leaves. Right, excellent. So it's really those entry and exit points for the system. Um, yeah, thank you for over this. It's fascinating to see because, you know, we talk so much about, or at least in parts of the press, you know, how much about the innovation is going into what's uh, in space, what's on the satellite itself. Um, but obviously each of those new capabilities, whether it's an enhancement to existing performance or new new kinds of data and put and, and operations, they it has to be matched by innovation on the ground segment that can that can handle the data and deal with the data. So it's interesting to to hear about all the different parts of it. Thank you. Now and on that, I mean new space missions have got lots of differences compared to traditional space missions. And you mentioned some of the traditional architecture versus the the newer um the mechanical pointing uh, antennas and stuff like that. But what does it mean from a ground station's perspective when you compare the requirements that new space missions have against traditional space missions? In traditional missions, the, the mission itself uh, had to contemplate and undertake the deployment of both the space segment and the ground segment. This involves deploying the control station to communicate with the with the satellite and traditionally is the operator who is responsible for both parts of the infrastructure. It is clear that uh, with new space or better said, uh, Leo Mio constellation defines a new paradigm and also in terms of communication and control. Uh, in this uh, new scenario, uh, there are different options. The operator of the constellation can decide to own also the, its own ground segment and deploy several antennas all around the world. Uh, or they can trust in a third party, typically a teleport, to accomplish this mission. So then they can save costs and at the same time they can mitigate risk. No? So these are the two options. In either case, uh, it's clear that the, for the control and communications of the new constellations uh, that are being de deployed with hundreds of satellites in each, each constellation, it is necessary to deploy new antennas on the ground all around the world to have 100% coverage uh, in every moment with every satellite, no, which is difficult. In addition, in order to achieve profitable uh, business model, it is necessary to adjust costs. And this uh, requires a standard, a standardization of processes, including the, the use of spectrum, allowing uh, new companies, uh, teleports to offer their services uh, to different clients, no, which uh, is mandatory to reduce costs and make this uh, new uh, business model profitable. Right, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, 
that, that makes sense. That's great. And uh, obviously that, that system is enabling smaller new, you know, new space companies to specialize because as you say, they don't have to build the, the relevant ground segment. They can access it from a third party. So that's, that's great. Now, and, and in such missions that we're seeing in, in new space, whether they're, you know, research or, or uh, the development of services, there's a lot of movement towards higher frequencies, as you'd expect, same as uh, terrestrial applications, which are becoming more and more hungry for data. Now, what sort of innovations are occurring on, in, on ground stations to keep up with the changing requirements of the, of the industry, of the space segment? Yeah, uh, for sure. It's clear whenever the technology allows it, um, we go to higher frequencies because everything gets smaller and also you can manage a more amount of data of information. So it's, a, it's very important and everybody looks to go higher in, in frequencies we, when it's possible now. But uh, at the same time, uh, the developments and new developments become more challenging at those frequencies because manufacturing of components are more complex, uh, everything is smaller, so it's, uh, it has pros and cons. And at the same time, you are allowed to, to get everything uh, more compact and also the antenna size, no? And we are uh, seeing this reduction of size, no? uh, for example, in, in, in the ground stations. But well, uh, also, as you say, uh, increasing in frequency, uh, what we get is to have higher absolute bandwidth and therefore greater upload and download data capacity, which is very important and interesting. And another reason to increase the frequency is the congestion of the, of the spectrum at lower bands, because this is becoming the, uh, really a, a big uh, real issue. Currently, uh, the highest band uh, used for communication with satellites, also for, for end user link, is uh, the K band, uh, which is becoming the, the most traditional. Uh, but it's also beginning to be uh, congested and therefore the use of QB band and also optical links uh, are already being explored and will be uh, ready in the, in the future. Focusing on antenna and on the rotating element part, I would say that the main innovations that are taking place are fairly, as mentioned, by going up in frequencies, everything becomes more compact and this allows to reduce dimensions. So going, for example, from antennas typically of uh, 7 to 13 meters in diameter, uh, the new ones uh, that the uh, two track Leo Mio satellites uh, can be uh, ranging from 2 to 5 meters, for example. And we are now, for example, collaborating with our clients who are, who are ground station antenna manufacturers or integrators, helping them uh, in their design at RF level while they focus on the mechanics uh, or the complete system, providing uh, with accurate models no, uh, that allows them to develop faster uh, their new uh, products. No? So this is uh, something doing. In addition, in traditional solutions, uh, I would say, around stations and mounting reflector uh, antennas, new manufacturing techniques are allowing also uh, to develop new components and also to reduce the number of parts using, for example, advanced manufacturing techniques, as we are already undertaking in some in some projects. For example, we are currently on a project for the European Space Agency for the development of an innovative K-band TM01 mod structure designed to provide a self-pointing capabilities to a compact satcom terminals or a small ground control station. So this is a, a, a example no, of a miniaturization, allowing to do everything more, more compact and integrating everything in, uh, in K-band as traditionally been done in, for example, X-band or S-band. If we go to new developments that are, that are now underway or that will arrive in the coming years. Uh, the main innovations uh, we can expect are uh, making use of QB band, as I have already said, uh, for the new control stations. Uh, there are already some examples of this with uh, some demonstrators, uh, such as uh, AlphaSat, Aldo Paragoni uh, satellite, or uh, developed by European Space Agency, or more recently, the UTELSAT Connect satellite, which incorporate QB band uh, solutions. Second, the use of uh, both flat and horn phase arrays antennas that allow multiple beams to connect to different satellites at the same time. For constellations, this is very interesting. No? And it did, in this line, we are working on the development of both in K-band and QB-band. 
and finally the optical links that uh, will allow massive data download no? and that can be very interesting for most demanding missions in, in terms of data no for example those those optical links that handle a large amount of information and that need to be downloaded as soon as possible this will be also possible in the in the coming years so these are the main uh, advances uh, we expect in the in the sector no uh, in the coming years Brilliant. Thank you. That's a, that's great. Um, a great overview. So like I say, it's, it's tallying with a lot of what we're seeing in the, the space sector, uh, the space segment side of things in order to, um, in order to deal with the, the data requirements. So that's great. Now you touched earlier on the, the fact that the geographical coverage of ground stations is, is an important factor for emissions and how, you know, we compared new space to traditional space missions, but ground stations are located in a limited number of sites around the world and there are new ones opening up but still obviously the limitations are there what kind of flexibility are ground stations able to provide today uh, to accommodate like the needs of different operators and their missions especially given the fact that they may operate in different frequencies and as you mentioned there are bands that are becoming congested and i think more specifically how does that translate into the change that need to be made in the elements such as what you provide, the the feeds, the antennas themselves, those sorts of things. There are certain locations on the planet that are optimal for satellite tracking communication. In any case, thanks to frequency regulation, all satellites or constellations must operate on specific frequencies, which helps to the deployment of the necessary infrastructure. For example, it's not necessary to deploy the whole new antennas per mission. It's true that there will be parts such as the modulators that maybe mission specific, but uh, these costs are a small part of the whole infrastructure investment. And a large part of the station is compatible for several missions. This makes teleport relevant, uh, as said before, allowing the overall cost of uh, the new mission to be reduced because this part of the infrastructure can be shared between different missions, between different uh, operators, can be paid by a third part which is offering uh, this service. So, this uh, can allow to to mitigate or, or reduce part of the of the investment needed for uh, the deployment of a complete um, constellation. Uh, for example, uh, for the part uh, we are today interested, which is the antenna, uh, it's an asset that uh, can be used by different missions uh, since the RF chains, including the reflector, is common to all of them. Once you have the the, the feed defined or designed for certain specific uh, frequency band no? and just changing part of the of the rf chain or the modem you can use the same infrastructure okay brilliant so there is flexibility there's plenty of flexibility there no, but, but obviously i mean there are plenty of existing ground stations that have been around for a long time they've um many legacy stations they've been around as long as space missions have have <laughs> been undertaken what sort of upgrades could such legacy stations, if we consider those, what sort of upgrades could they could they do to stay relevant or even future proof themselves to to deal with some of the innovations that you've mentioned are, are, are on the way? Yeah, yeah. What we are seeing is that uh, many customers are uh, looking to upgrade existing antennas rather to uh, install new ones, so they can remain operational. No? Uh, for example, one thing we see and we are doing in different projects is to adapt the, the feed and the RF change to new frequencies uh, while maintaining the, the optics of the antenna, uh, mainly the reflector, which is a very expensive part of the of the hardware. Uh, this means that uh, while maintaining one of the most expensive parts uh, uh, of the ground station, uh, you can still use uh, the whole ground station uh, to work in new bands, for example, from systems traditionally operating in S-band, pass to multi-frequency systems operating in XK-band you know, systems. And in other cases, what we also see is the improvement of existing systems uh, by incorporating new or improving, improved functionalities, such as the inclusion of tracking monocores solutions to, uh, to allow the correct pointing of the antennas. And we have also had uh, to do this type of things uh, with some clients you know, in, in the past. Uh, we like this kind of project uh, very much because they fit perfectly with uh, our capabilities. Uh, this is where we can support our customers by offering them solutions tailored to their needs uh, on the basis of a given antenna 
that must be continue operative. Just a couple of samples of projects we have recently accomplished. First, one client requested us, for example, to perform an upgrade of a 13 meter ground station antenna they have in, in its portfolio, operating in S band to operate in dual S X band, but maintaining the optics. Uh, this has been done, the same in a specific dual band fit, including monopulse tracking for, for pointing, for, for pointing purposes. Second example, uh, we have uh, also provided the support to certain teleport operators, providing them consultancy services at antenna level to help them to decide uh, whether install a brand new ground station or retrofit a old one only in the RF chain or RF part, allowing him to, to save money. So yeah, uh, we have great expertise design in reflectors and fit chains, not only for ground stations, but also subcon terminals, scientific and space application. And this give us a great overview of problems no? and how different systems must operate and also uh, the understanding of what our clients need. Uh, and this allows us to provide them the right solution in every time. It's usually going to be better for, for clients to um, upgrade what they have and adapt what they have to the, the needs of new missions. And specifically, as you've said, if this involves adapting the feed chain or, or, or leaving in place and operational, the most expensive parts, uh, the, the reflector, the optics of the antennas, then yeah, that's going to be beneficial for them. So that's great. We've, we've mentioned some of the, um, the, the trends that we see in the industry and how these are uh, impacting the work that you, you guys are doing and that ground stations are having to deal with. Sort of things like the miniaturization of hardware, but also, which has been going on for a long time, but also these emerging ideas or, or the um, solutions people are testing, like software defined technologies or the edge processing of data in, in space or, um, or on the ground, I guess. Um, these are, you know, pretty prominent themes in upstream satellite development. Is this something you're also seeing in the ground segment? Are these changes translating through to, to new um, requirements or new discussions with your clients? Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, this is not uh, a part where we are uh, really involved. Uh, we are aware of that and, uh, and of technological advance are also reaching the, the, the control centers. And all this uh, is already being incorporated, allowing, uh, for example, to operate satellites remotely uh, from anywhere in the world, uh, and, as, and as happens in other sectors. No? Uh, traditionally, you think in a group, of, in a team, working in the same room not to, to operate the, the satellite, but uh, not anymore. It's, it's, it's mandatory. Uh, you can operate your satellite anywhere no? and uh, operate remotely. And that's thanks to, to digitalization and uh, standardization of uh, processes. And of course, uh, this allows uh, ground stations that can be operated, uh, multiple satellites, uh, even from different constellations at the same time in remote uh, areas or remotely. And for example, there are companies that without having the necessary infrastructure in terms of antennas, uh, offer services of full uh, constellation operation, and this is possible thanks to digitalization again. And new, more open business models and the existence of independent teleports all over the world uh, that offer their services and connectivity capacity allows this uh, new business model. So, yeah, for sure. Brilliant. Yeah, you've mentioned um, standardization previously and digitalization. Yeah, really key uh, key drivers of some of these changes in the industry. So that's great. Thanks. Just finally, I ask a version of this question to most of our guests. I wondered what other trends do you see happening in, in your field, in ground station equipment, you know, in general, in the next sort of five years? And what are you, uh, at ESL Group, what are you most excited about? What are you looking forward to? In the short term, uh, we do not expect major technological developments, but we expect uh, developments in terms of business model with teleports and companies offering Antennas as a service becoming increasingly relevant in the operation of certain missions and becoming important partners for, for operators. In the mid-long term, uh, we do expect new ground station architectures and as far as we are concerned, new antenna and radiating element architectures with multiple options, uh, reflector, phase array and optical links that will coexist and that uh, each one will certain advantage depending on each mission or, or on each uh, constellation. We do not think that uh, the traditional ground station will disappear 
we do not expect that the uh, optical lens are, are going to, to cover everything. So every, all the all the options will coexist. And as for spectrum regulation and spectrum use, uh, what we expect is that uh, as has happened in the past, uh, as technology permits, uh, higher and higher frequency band will be sought. Uh, that will allow the management of more information and also the congestion of a lower part of the spectrum. Uh, in our case, uh, we are committed to continue to develop antennas and feed systems that meet the, the demands of our customers and the needs we currently see and expect to continue to see um, multi-frequency systems, especially covering the S-band, X-band and increasingly K-band and QB-band. Uh, increasingly compact systems, uh, but with the same or better performance, which is challenging also. And uh, finally, and um, as I said uh, further on, uh, the leap to higher frequencies, uh, use of phase array antennas, also for run station, and increasingly the use of optical uh, links is forcing. And it is clear that, as it has been the case in recent years, the space sector will continue to change rapidly with new entry players, uh, new ideas, and we at EOSOLA Space expect to be ready to address all these new challenges in terms of antennas that are coming up. And of course, we will continue to offer our customers a state-of-the-art antennas and fit solutions, not only in ground station, but also for scientific space and defense application. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That's, um... That's a great place to, to wrap up the conversation. So, yeah, I think, Kim, you will have taught our listeners today a, a great deal about the operation of ground stations and the and antennas uh, on them and how this uh, area is changing as well. It's great to see these advances in flexibility, but with a focus on the commercial aspects of them. So upgrading existing you know, technologies and, and equipment where required and making things more versatile to adapt to new business models, I think is it's a really interesting area. And, and yeah, best of luck from from us and everything that you're doing in this area so, and thank you for sharing all that those insights on the podcast today thanks to you and thanks to Sat Search because uh, you are doing a great job oh thank you very much it's very kind and to all our listeners out there thank you very much for spending time with us on the Space Industry Podcast today if you'd like to find out more about ESL Group and the, the company's work and the capabilities in uh, addressing a lot of the, the problems and the opportunities that we've discussed in the podcast today We'll have uh, plenty of links in the show notes and you can find out more uh, at the company's website on the SatSearch platform. And, um, and on the platform too, we can also help you with any, uh, any queries you may have regarding technical documentation, information, introductions to the company, those sorts of things. And um, yeah, just wanted to thank you again for, uh, for your time and attention and we look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Space Industry by SatSearch. I hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit. We'll be back soon with more in-depth, behind-the-scenes insights from private space businesses. In the meantime, you can go to satsearch.com for more information on the space industry today, or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments. To stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter, and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store, or whichever podcast service you typically use.